So when you can combine different elements of whether it is like curiosity, humor, those things, you're going to get people to at least open the email versus blending in with, like you said, it could be a few months, it could be a few a day of these types of messages that you're getting. At least give yourself that chance to stand out a little bit. Initiating becoming a hiring machine sequence in three, two, one. Hey everyone, it's Sam Keenly and welcome to Becoming a Hiring Machine. This is the show dedicated to fixing recruitment by going beyond saying what needs to change and instead teaches you how to make that change. Today, we have an incredible Tactical Tuesday ahead of us, but before we get into that, I just want to tell you a little bit about the show. What we have here is shows within the show. Some days we have interviews with industry thought leaders and others who are shaking up the space. Other days we cover trending topics, items that recruiters are talking about or will be very soon and what those mean for them. Every Tuesday, like today, drop by for a Tactical Tuesday episode where we go deep on how to do something that will help drive better results in your day-to-day as soon as you finish listening. Sometimes we open it up for Q&A. Y'all can drop in questions to us that you'd like to hear us take on. Send those over to us at podcast at loxo.co. And occasionally you'll hear a mic drop episode where Matt joins to share something that he's been thinking about within the recruitment space and wants to share with you. All right, today's Tactical Tuesday. I bet you can't guess who's joining. It is Vivian yet again, but this one's going to be a little bit different. It's going to be fun. She is going to join us to talk about something I know every recruiter and marketer like me wants to solve for. How do you write emails that get replies? Sounds simple, not so much. So from subject lines to email length to what happens after you get a response, we're going to cover it all. So Vivian, you ready to jump into this one? I'm ready when you are. All right, perfect. So what we'll do is let's take it from the top. So like subject lines, messaging, everything else. So very first thing is subject lines. What are your thoughts or recommendations? You know, I want to get my email read. That's usually kind of the first screening spot is, is the subject line interesting? Or, or what do you do there to help increase your odds of, of not only being open, but getting a reply from it? It comes down to kind of being a little bit different and standing out. And you can do this by what is in marketing called pattern disruption. Um, and so when you think about like recruiter messages and everyone probably gets one or two at least uh, in their lifetime on LinkedIn, it's typically first name, comma, great opportunity for you. And so you want to obviously stand out from the crowd because especially great candidates that you're supposed to be finding, they probably are getting bombarded with a million emails and all of them have something along the lines of great opportunity for you, amazing opportunity, great job in your area or something like that. So you want it to be slightly different. You can do this by adding a couple of emojis um, or switching things up um, by just not using that particular headline. Something that I have found great success in is to use one-liner dad jokes in the subject line related to a particular profession I was recruiting on. Um, So one that really stands out that was a hit was I was working on um, a job in the construction industry. So the subject line was, so if I were to message you, Sam, I would be like, Sam, what do construction workers do at a party? And you'd have to open the message to then say, see the answer, which was, they raised the roof. <laughs> oh my God, that's and amazing. So, <laughs> so you can just even pique somebody's curiosity by just having a really funny, interesting, random um, subject line, um, like a dad joke. There's plenty for accountants. There's so many for ITs, for engineers and things like that. Um, throw in a couple of emojis be different. I mean, what's the worst Mm -hmm. case scenario? Somebody opens it and says, thanks for the chuckle. I'm not interested. Um, Best case scenario, they say I'm interested and I raise you one and I give you a different dad joke. Um, So like, it's always fun. Everybody appreciates a chuckle, especially in their LinkedIn inbox, because everybody's always asking for something Mm -hmm. because the recruiter is asking like, I want you to interview for this position is essentially what it sounds like when you receive this message and you want it to be like, hey, I'm here for you. Here's a joke to brighten your day. So even if you're not interested, at least I made you chuckle, hopefully. Um, And emojis are a really great one as well. Um, And kind of or even just being silly. Like I had one that was like a chemical position. So it was like, hey, we're looking for like a chemical ninja. Are you it? Or something like that. Just something that is a little bit different that has a different spin on just, hey, I have this great opportunity for you, which is every recruiter ever. (laughs) Yeah, there's so many things in there that you have going for you when you're able to do that. One, Hung Lee joined us for a podcast, I think it was a handful of months ago at this point, but he called it just give someone a little plus in their day. And it goes so far. So like, so those jokes, 
they do that exact type of thing where it's like when you can get those little pluses, they'll at least remember you, even if they're not interested in that role. But it, it just it changes the mentality. And, you you know, they might have that might have been the final straw. They're having a bad day and they were going to reply with some nasty email back or a message back to you that all of a sudden it turns in. They might just be like, thank you. Or who knows? They might go home and use that dad joke um, on their own family when they get back. But <laughs> um, so that I love that. When you said, you know, the the stereotypical subject line, hey, we've got an opportunity for you. This is the exact equivalent of the first line of every email. It's hope this message finds you well. Like, just stop. Don't use it. It's not effective. People read through it. They glass over it. Like, why are you wasting the space? It's not that effective. So I want to add a couple more that I've seen from the marketing side. So on top of what you've shared, so the emojis, what I, one thing I've seen that when people are thinking about what can you add into the subject line, they're also saying, what can you take away from the subject line? So if you go and look at like a Gmail inbox, they call it white space. Or if you make a super short subject line, you usually see people just trying to stuff that, take up all the space. But when everyone does that, you stand out by doing the opposite. So that's one one way that people have done it. And the other, and what, what you started to get at in the beginning is it's Peaking curiosity. So like your dad joke leaned into this. They have to click in to read the answer. But even I was talking to Kyle on our team. He was like, a subject line that worked really well for me was confidential search. Because some people are like, who? Interesting. I, I do want to read more. So when you can combine different elements of whether it is like curiosity, humor, um, those things, you're going to get people to at least open the email versus blending in with the, like you said, you know, it could be a few months. It could be a few a day of these types of messages that you're getting at least give yourself that chance to stand out a little bit. Yeah, definitely. Or even just like starting a message and like cutting it short as if it was like by accident and then I have to open to keep reading. Um, And I think we ran into this like a couple of like weeks back on one of the business development episodes where we were like, um, ever dream of a smooth data migration or something like that. Just Mm -hmm. cut it off in the middle. Something that would like, is like a hot topic for that particular um, industry or position. Um, and just something different is really what it is. I like it. All right. So we've gotten people interested. They saw a subject line. They were intrigued. Now we're getting into the message itself. And I know this is something people always say like, Oh, I've got them hooked. Now I'm going to, you know, write, you know, insert the Holy Bible, the, like the the longest (laughs) book you could possibly think of. And (laughs) that's where things go wrong. So what's your advice? And when, before we get into the meat of it, like, subject length or not subject length, um, content length, how long should they be aiming for? I think LinkedIn actually shared that messages between 400 and 600 characters get the most responses. Um, so I would stick to that. Um, that is one thing. Um, so visually it's not a long message. Um, Mm -hmm. I had a client of mine tell me that somebody else reached out to him um, offering recruiting services. And it was this like long email where it cut off and he had to click on view the entire message to get onto like a separate page just to see the full message. And he was like, I'm not going to read that. Like, give me a couple of bullet points, keep it short. And so even within the 400 to 600 character limit, you can write one long paragraph. Nobody's going to want to read that as soon as they open that message. They're going to be like, oh, I don't want to read this. This is this giant block of text. So break it up. Have like a quick little introduction sentence like this is the company or if you can't say what the company is, just like briefly describe it. Jump into a couple of really good bullet points and then just like a closing statement with a call to action and then sent. Keep it super simple. Keep it short and sweet. You don't want to tell them everything. This is something you want to cover during the screening call once you're actually getting into the conversation. This is just, hey, these are the basics. Are you interested? Yes or no? Um, but obviously, the more friendly matter. So just in that kind of format, um, I typically just started with introducing the company or a little bit about what they do or like the context mm-hmm. of the position, one or two sentences. And then I would add like three up to five bullet points of specific things that were really cool about this position, like essentially selling points. Um, So for example, if they had really great flexibility, uh, work-life balance and things like that, and I knew that for that particular industry and position, people get burned out really quickly or they get taken advantage of and they're just working 24 seven, I would put that in there. So essentially you wanna kind of put yourself in the position of the candidate and see, okay, what is really important about this position? And even Mm -hmm. think about yourself, what three to five bullet points would you need to see 
to respond to a message of a recruiter saying, you know what, I actually want to learn a little bit more about this opportunity. Like for me, it's not, would you like to be like an operations manager or something like that? I'm not interested in that. Mm -hmm. um, so figure out like for yourself, what are the three to five bullet points that would get you really interested in a position and want to learn more about it? And then kind of flip it on the other side of like, okay, the particular candidate that I'm looking for probably wants growth opportunities if it's like middle management or something like that. And kind of include that in there, just short and sweet to the point, and then um, a call to action. But we can get into that a little bit um, a little yeah. bit later in this episode because that's a whole different thing. Yeah, and I like how you said, you know, stop selling in the sense of like stop trying to like push the company like you'd push a product, but more put yourself in the shoes of the candidate. What are they interested in? And use this as a way to proactively get ahead of some of those questions because they're not going to reply back. Be like, that sounds great. Here's five questions, 10 questions I have about the role to qualify myself. Like if you can do that, you're you're more likely to get a reply. Shocking. So um, one, one thing I was, I was thinking about also, and this goes back to a conversation. I feel like I keep name dropping all of our guests that have been on the show, but it's all coming together and I love it. So MJ joined us and she was talking about how she positions how she writes like what the role is not in the sense of like you're responsible for these types of things but we're looking for an individual who thrives trying to build new systems we want an individual who is challenged by meeting a you know a high quota because we're a startup and it does this great job of, of bridging the gap between what's the company need but also letting people qualify themselves in that aspect of like it plays the emotional side and and like when they have the growth mindset like you said it pulls those right people for you so when you can marry that all together i think that's such a, a good a good play to do and i'm curious to get your take on this um i have a very strong point of view on it compensation when do you mm -hmm. share it do you do it in an email it depends on the position. Um, if it's confidential, I I don't know. Like it really depends. Oftentimes what I found is that when I do an outreach message and people respond, the first question, if I don't include compensation is, well, what's the compensation? Mm -hmm. um, here's the thing. If it's something where you know this is underpaid, do you even want to reach out to candidates knowing most likely this is an underpaid or under market value pay that they have? to top-notch candidates just because this is how you start, not necessarily, but at the same time, you don't want to waste their time. And so I ended up just including it always because if it was outrageously low, I would get very angry feedback. Mm -hmm. And for me, I didn't care that it was angry. I cared that I got a response because then I could say, okay, I reached out to this many candidates and I've got this many responses. And so clients wanted to also see, okay, if I'm reaching out to this many people, how many are actually responding to me? Because if I'm sending 100 messages out and I'm only getting 30 responses, you know, like they can do this on their own. But if I say, you know what, I reached out to 100 people and 50 responded, here's the breakdown of the responses and what they've been saying, here's market feedback, that's really helpful. And at the very least, it can also be something that promotes a little bit more of the salary transparency because then people can be like, wait a minute, I'm in a similar position. I'm actually making $20,000 less. This I'm supposed to have more. I didn't know. And so unless you like present it, you won't get any kind of feedback. And ultimately the benefit of being a recruiter and the value of being a recruiter is being able to give market insights. How are you going to get market insights if you're not transparent and not even open to potentially getting like angry feedback just because something's outrageous, whether in a good or a bad way. Um, and for me, like, especially now with inflation and everything, cost of living has gone up so much. People have certain living expenses. They cannot go below that. So even if this is the perfect position, they would absolutely love that. If their financial responsibilities are above your compensation range, like significantly, they can't make this work. Ultimately, people need to pay for just existing. Um, that's just what life is. And if they can't cover those basic costs, then you're not going to make that switch no matter how lucrative and great that position is. Um, mm -hmm. So instead of wasting time, I typically just included it in there and then still had like a solid call of action to make sure that even if it was something they weren't interested in, I would get, still get a response from them, at least saying, hey, yeah. I'm not interested. This is too low. And then I could ask, well, what compensation would you need to see? What do you think is fair? You know, and then I can provide that feedback to 
the client because typically HR is not about to tell you, hey, everybody actually needs $20,000 more. Um, yeah. Yeah. So it's a combination of, of like you said, it's the tra- it helps promote transparency, but I think of objection handling and, um, you know, if you come back and and you tell them, I don't think people are going to bite on this role, um, you might want to raise the, the salary or anything based on the research that we have. No, no, no. This is what we're paying. This is what we're doing. Send those emails out with the low one. And what you can do is you can gather those as data points. Here's all these people that specifically called out, like the job is interesting, or they didn't say anything about that, but they said, this is way too low. I would never move for this. That doesn't make sense. So it helps you on that sense. And then you can also position it to them and be like, hey, we can remove this. And you probably have a bunch more people that are interested in, in um, you know, applying for the role, but you're going to then be spending multiple 30 to 60 minute interviews with them. You're going to get to the end and say, hey, here's the comp range and they're going to laugh and you're going to have wasted so much time. So that's where it really helps with screening. And, um, you know, as you get ahead of some of those conversations, it's it's not a I can't find the right people for you. It's you're what you're looking for is not aligned with market expectations for this role. Yeah. And something that is also part of kind of client um, management is parenting. And the only way that you can parent them is if you have data points to back it up. Um, you can tell them, hey, from my experience as a recruiter, people are not going to go for this. This is a too low ball offer. You're asking for too many um, qualifications, experiences for a budget that's just not, it's just not going to happen. And you can say this and hiring managers are going to be like, well, obviously, because like our fee is based on the first year salary. Of course, you're going to say this. But if you kind of say, you know what, let me just do a little bit of market research. Let's regroup in about two, three weeks, and I'll give you feedback from my outreach. And then we can talk about um, this position and what the market feedback is in general, what are candidates looking for, um, how are they responding to this position, and kind of position yourself as a partner to them and say, let's figure out how to make this a really attractive job offer. Who can we actually target with this? Because especially if you have a very low budget, for one reason or another, then you can find someone who would be promoted up into that and you just have to provide some extra training, which is a little bit more time and effort internally, but that's not an extra headcount type cost Mm -hmm. um, that goes out of a specific financial bucket. It comes out of a time bucket that you would have to invest in, but when whoever you're going to hire, you're going to have to train them up anyways. Might as well find some things you can train them in that you can invest a little bit of time in them so that you can actually make this a really great offering because you want someone who's excited to be joining your company, not like, oh, I'm making this switch because this is where in the offer stage, you can then get ghosted or something happens where they take a counter offer. You spend all this time going through this, uh, like like the interview process and things like that. And all of a sudden they just vanish and ghost you. Um, So these are things that you ideally want to kind of address head on early on. And then as a recruiter, you can position yourself as a partner and say, listen, this is the market feedback. I think if we make these changes, we can actually make this a really attractive position and people are going to be excited about this. I don't think we can go for this particular level. I don't think this is a lateral move type thing where we can look for that. But I think we can get somebody who has been at a smaller company and wants to step into more responsibilities, come to a bigger company. It's still slightly below market value, but for them, it would be a salary increase. Um, It would be a great growth opportunity. Just working for a company is going to be a really great boost. And then obviously, it's up to you to figure out how to retain them and actually get them excited to stay long term. Um, But that's a topic for another day. (laughs) Yeah. And Um, that, my friend, is the difference between a trusted advisor and a recruiter. Yeah. Um, because you're not just trying to find candidates that match the resume and then send them and then down at the offer stage, you're like, oh, wait a minute, there's like a $50,000 discrepancy in salary expectations versus the budget. Um, It would be the first time that this happens, but you want somebody who's a partner. And this is also what goes back to that initial um, call with your client after signing them or even doing an intake call about a particular position. What are your non-negotiables? Like, are you like, are you really harping on that bachelor's degree, or is the work experience more valuable for you? Mm-hmm. Like, you know, and yeah. this is where you kind of have to negotiate a little bit on the front end, and this is what makes a recruiter really valuable, and then justifies those outrageous placement fees. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. All right. Covered the meat of the the message, and now we get into the final part: the call to action. Hmm. What's your play here? Um, 
I actually ended up getting a recruiter message one day and um, that recruiter said, if you're not interested, just let me know. I'll take you off our list. I was definitely not interested in that position. That was like not a good position at all. Not a good message. But that last sentence, I was like, you know what? I'm going to respond because I am not interested. I don't want to hear from this particular recruiter anymore. Um, And just saying, I'll take you off my list. You will never hear from me again. I responded. And ultimately, you just want a response because then you can say, hey, I have more responses than any other recruiter that you work with at the very least. And I started using that. And I ended up getting a lot of people that say, you know what? I'm not interested in this position, but I'd like to hear about others that you have in the future. And this is where I was like, well, what is it that you're looking for? I'll keep an eye out for you and I'll let you know. This is market feedback. It's not directly that they're giving you, I'm not interested in this position for this, this, and this reason, but they're telling you, I am interested in this. And Mm -hmm. if the position that you have doesn't match what they're looking for, you can let them know and say, I found really great candidates that fit exactly what you're looking for, but this is what those candidates are looking for. And so even if you get not interested right now, I'm happy where I'm at, you know, this is, you can still say, you know what, like, I don't want to intrude, feel free not to respond to this message, but I'm curious, what makes you happy in this role? Like, what is it that gets you exciting? You know, like, or maybe do you even know anyone who would be interested or something like that? And so you can start a conversation, even by just having like, totally understand if you're not interested. Um, I'll take you off our list. Just let me know. But if you are interested, I'm happy to tell you more. I'm happy to tell you um, where it is, like any info that you want to have additionally. Um, I can do the job description, whatever you want to do. Like, I'm happy to tell you more, obviously, if you're interested. But those not interested are so incredibly valuable as well. And you want to capture those. Because when you're not interested in a particular position, the default is you're just not going to respond. You're going to ignore but this is where valuable feedback can get lost. So if you say, just let me know if you're not interested and don't want to hear from me, I totally respect that. And then you respectfully say, totally understand, what would you be looking for? What do you want to want me to keep an eye out for you? Um, if I see it come across my desk or something like that, that is hidden feedback. Mm-hmm. Oh, it's huge feedback. I love that. It's such a good, smart play because it, it takes it from being pushy to having a conversation. And One other thing my mind immediately went to when you were sharing that is you're reaching out to these candidates. You've sourced them. You've went through, put in your filter criteria. You know, you've searched. You should really be reaching out to only however many people that that you think are truly would be great fit. These individuals are usually good performers no matter what. So the other value of this and where I think so many recruiters could benefit in the long tail is think of this as the long game, not just a per job basis, but for your career, for your business growth long term. Because if you have a proper recruiting CRM, you're taking this information, you source them, you've already said they're a good candidate. Now you're going and putting in tags or notes for yourself like, hey, this person is looking for this type of role and you've already sourced them. So then when you go back and start searches later on, you're not from scratch. You've already got a list of, you know, people you said this will be a great CFO someday. This will be a great marketing manager someday. So this also increases your flywheel long term. So that's another little trick that I'm sure some recruiters are are making use of. But that's that's how you work smarter at the end of the day. Definitely. And something that I ended up um, learning throughout this process is that I would get random feedback and I would write it down in the notes. And I oftentimes wasn't able to get back to those candidates. But when I was having conversations with hiring managers, doing business development, I'd be like, you know what? I actually talked to a couple of candidates that would be interested in this position, but they were kind of looking at this price range. They were looking at these responsibilities. They were So I can already just in business development calls recall a couple of conversations and feedback that I got from um, past candidates that I reached out to that said, actually not interested for XYZ reason. Um, And this is how you can create value during business development conversations. And Mm -hmm. nothing may come from it that particular moment, but you gave something valuable to that hiring manager. And this is what ultimately makes you stand out because you have shown them, hey, I know what I'm talking about. I am talking to these candidates. This is the feedback that I am getting. Um, I just talked to someone that actually shared this particular feedback with me. Um, and this makes you really valuable because it's your network. It's your hands-on knowledge. And, um, 
that's what sets you apart. And ultimately, that's what a recruiter is. It's somebody who knows things that hiring managers and HR just don't know because they're not in the trenches. Mm -hmm. And so you now have people who are interested. They want to try things out. They've gotten a lot of great advice here. My marketer brain is like, well, how do you go about setting out an experiment for this? Do I do it on a job by job basis? Do I do it on an A-B testing type basis? If you were to try and set something like this up, what would your recommendation be? A-B testing. <laughs> so A-B testing is essentially where you um, have, let's say, 100 candidates that you're reaching out to. Uh, 50 are going to get the traditional, I have a great opportunity for you email uh, with a long job description, your typical shenanigans. Um, and then you put 50 into the experimental bucket. Um, you put emojis in the subject line, you open up with a dad joke, you do bullet points, you use emojis as bullet points. Um, you keep it short and simple and have a call to action. Hey, if you're interested, let's chat, set up something via my Calendly. If you're not interested, just let me know. I'll take you off our list. I won't bother you ever again. And then obviously also respect that. Do not bother them again, because otherwise this is where you get into hot water. Um, and just test it and see how are your response rates. Um, check your metrics. Check your response rates. Um, what are candidates doing? Uh, what is their feedback? Um, and see how it goes. And this is how you can essentially see, okay, is this actually working? Now, something to keep in mind is there are certain positions and um, jobs and industries where people respond to a more serious message and other times people just really are looking for that little chuckle. And this is where you just kind of have to test it out. Um, ultimately, people will remember you for standing out and you just have to figure out how you want to stand out, infuse your personality, mm -hmm. try different things out. This is something that you just have to try over time. As you're getting to know uh, what candidates are saying, I'm actually more interested in flexibility and you were pitching great pay and they're like, I actually like pay is fine. Like I'm financially comfortable. I just want to do something that is really fun for me. That gives me flexibility. You mm -hmm. can then learn from that, take note of that. And then when you do another round of outreach, you can adjust your outreach campaign and see, okay, now that I've gotten that feedback from the initial outreach, I'm doing a second round. I've sourced some more candidates. These are the things that are important to them. Let's see how that outreach campaign is going and kind of learn as you go, find your own voice and um, see what works and check your metrics, see how people are responding. And you'll probably also tell because it's going to get a lot more fun. Researching dad mm -hmm. jokes was a really great part of the day. Um, and it's a great conversation starter. And by the time that you get to that screening call, candidates are not as freaked out. They feel a little bit more comfortable with you because you introduce yourself as somebody who's quite relaxed, but still serious and professional. Um, having a sense of humor and being professional are not mutually exclusive. And you can demonstrate as a demonstrate that as a recruiter. And that's a really cool part about it. Yeah, I love it. Well, I know that a lot of people are going to take some incredible messages, ideas, thoughts away from this conversation. So I can't wait to hear from, from the recruiters who go out and, you know, try some of the things that they've learned today, apply them, and then hopefully we get to hear back some fun success stories from it. So Vivian, thank you as always for joining us. Truly really appreciate you coming and sharing your knowledge as you always do. And yeah, as I said, can't wait to hear how others are applying this in their day-to-day -day moving forward. So everyone, that is another Tactical Tuesday with Vivian. Until next time. <laughs>